Why grow homes? Because we can. Right now, America is in an unremitting state of trauma, and there's a cause for that, right? We've got McPeople, McCars, McHouses, right? As an architect, I have to confront something like this. So what's a technology that will allow us to make ginormous houses? Well, it's been around for 2,500 years. It's called pleaching, or grafting trees together, or grafting inosculate matter into one contiguous vascular system. And we do something different than what we did in the past. We add a, a kind of a modicum of intelligence to that. We use CNC to make scaffolding, to train semi-epithetic matter plants into a specific geometry that makes a home that we call a fab tree hat. It fits into the environment. It is the environment. It is the landscape, right? And you can have 100 million of these homes, and it's great because they suck carbon, right? They're perfect. You can have 100 million families or sub take things out of the suburbs, because these are homes that are a, a part of the environment. Imagine pre-growing a village, right? It takes about seven to 10 years, and everything is green, right? So not only do we do, do, we do the veggie house, we also do uh, uh, the in vitro meat habitat, or homes that we're doing research on now uh, in Brooklyn, where as an architecture office, we're the first of its kind to put in a molecular cell biology lab and start experimenting with regenerative medicine and tissue engineering and start thinking about what the future would be if architecture and biology became one. So we've been doing this for a couple of years and that's our lab. And what we do is we grow extracellular matrix from pigs, we use a modified inkjet printer and we print geometry. We print geometry where we can make industrial design objects, right? like uh, you know, shoes, leather belts, handbags, etc., cetera, uh, where no sentient creature is harmed. It's victimless. It's meat from a test tube. So our theory is that eventually we should be, we should be doing this with homes. So here is a typical stud wall in uh, architectural construction, and this is a section of our proposal for a meat house, where you can see we use fatty cells as insulation, cilia for dealing with wind loads, and sphincter muscles for the doors and windows. <laughs> and we know it's... It's incredibly ugly, but it, you know, it could have been an, an English Tudor or a Spanish colonial, but we kind of chose this shape. And there it is, kind of uh, grown, at least one particular section of it. We had a big show in Prague, and we decided to put it in front of uh, the cathedral so religion can confront the house of meat. That's why we grow homes. Thanks very much. electric grid was conceived in the age of Edison, designed in the age of Eisenhower, installed in the age of Nixon, and it has not been upgraded since. It's just not able to keep up with modern needs. Well, the notion of the smart grid is using what we have better, making do with what we've got and not build so much new infrastructure. Software at the gateway between generation and transmission can solve that problem. The smart grid is actually a bunch of smart devices connected over a network to a bunch of computers. And the computers crunch all this data and then are able to optimize the system. What we're working on is helping utilities see what's actually happening in real time in terms of the flow of electricity between all those devices. Benefits the consumers, benefits the environment, all because of things we can now see that we couldn't see before. On the Olympic Peninsula, PNNL's goal was to make the smart grid tangible. We were taking home area networks as a way of sending messages to the homes and to the devices in the homes about when they should run or not run. There was one other modem here that captured wirelessly the reports from the different elements. We saved approximately during this time. 15% of our electric bill. If we can do that for everybody in the country, we're talking about saving $100 billion worth of infrastructure that we won't need to build. IBM has been the first big company to really see the opportunity to marry information technology with the grid. There are similar things going on in South America, Asia, in Europe. We've been working with Malta to make both the water and electricity systems much more efficient. It is a model for how we can then bring that to other larger geographic areas. 
The path forward to a smart grid is actually quite clear. We upgraded our telecommunications networks, our satellite networks, and we can do the exact same thing uh, with a smart grid. A wind plant will go up and down by the minute. A solar plant will go up and down as clouds go over. So having a grid that can flex itself and manage these, these kinds of things is critical. We need to be planning for the kind of future that we say we want, which is an era of cheap, reliable, clean electricity for decades to come.